Um, so first off, before I start, uh, apologies as well to, so the uh, talk was advertised as Canberra Audivision, uh, but I'm only talking about the Cambrian today because I tried to add in my Audivision sections and found that if I did that, the talk blew out to about 50 minutes. So I just cut them. Um, but if anyone has any questions about the Audivision of the Amadeus that I'm currently working on, feel free to ask at the end. I'm happy to answer questions as well. A lot of that's unpublished at the moment. So if anyone is interested, I'm happy to talk about them, but I don't, can't share anything at the moment in terms of sort of publications. Uh, but all, most of the Cambrian stuff, bar one, is published. So that should be uh, of interest to people that want any of it shared. So uh, without further ado, my name's Patrick. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Is that all right? Yep. Yes. I'm assuming yes. <laughs> can you see it, Sabine? Yep. I'm all good, thanks. Yes. Yep. Thank you. So, so I work as a technical officer at the Australian Museum in the paleontology collection there. Uh, and I'll be looking at and talking to you today about my research on mainly trilobites, although there's other faunas, as well as the isotopes from the Cambrian sections of the Amadeus Basin. Um, and I do enjoy the irony of the fact that I put the Bakuda sandstone there, even though I won't be talking about it. So to start off, I didn't know if people uh, would know if or what a trilobite is. Um, so trilobites are an extinct group of marine arthropods. So these guys are basically like a, a crustacean or an insect. They have a segmented body. They make, uh, they make an exoskeleton out of calcium carbonate. And they're named after the fact that they have three lobes. They have a left and right pleural lobe, as well as a central axial lobe. Uh, you might have watched David Attenborough's first life and seen him say they're called that because they have a head, a body, and a tail. And that's actually inaccurate. Um, David Attenborough made a big mistake. That's one of his mistakes that I like to keep on record. Um, uh, now, when people often uh, think of trilobites, they think of the whole creature, but unfortunately, a lot of the time when you find them, you only find them as pieces. So what I'll be showing throughout this talk is generally pieces of trilobite. So this, for example, here is a tail of a trilobite. This is one from New South Wales, from Western New South Wales. And so often, because they would molt their exoskeleton, a bit like a crab or an insect would, that would often break apart and then be washed and be uh, piled up in sediment heaps. So we, somebody mentioned before, that they'd seen in the Amadeus heaps of trilobite bits and pieces. And that's exactly what you find is basically bits and pieces of molts generally. Now trilobites were quite common during the Ordovician, uh, the Ordovician and Cambrian. And so that's the first sort of two periods in uh, what we generally find as sort of skeletal or body fossils in the fossil record uh, as you move further along. However, they did exist all the way from about 521 million years ago, all the way up to about 250 million years ago. Uh, they didn't do so well towards the end, however, they were more common during the Cambrian and Ordovician. So here we have, for example, a number of families that appeared. And as you can see, they're quite abundant in terms of the number of family diversity early on. And so that makes them incredibly useful tools. Uh, so they're incredibly useful as, let's see if I can get my slide to change. Oh, back. So they're incredibly useful in what's called biostratigraphy. So for those that aren't familiar with biostratigraphy, Basically, it's using fossils to see if you can correlate packages of rock. So in this case here, we're just, I'm using this as an example. You can see here we have sort of a, a set of outcrop, a set of mountains. We've collected a sample from somewhere and that sample we found a trilobite in. Now that trilobite here, you can see is similar to some of the trilobites from other described sections that people have reported before. And so we can start to go along and make comparisons with these. And sometimes we can even make a large sort of composite column. So this is a composite of the geology of this sort of area, hypothetical area down here. And we'll notice that sample A, B and C are next to sort of an old volcano. And that's given us these nice layers here that we can volcanically date using isotopes. And these radioactive isotopes give us some nice ages. And we'll notice that our fossil here, although our beds that we're sampling don't have any radioactive minerals in them to date, we do have a fossil that is bracketed by two over here. And so if we look at our ranges of our species, it falls within this range here, which is only between 410 and 411 million years old. And so what do you do? We can actually date these rocks here without having any volcanic minerals in them by just using the fossils. And so using fossils alone, you can date sets of rocks. And so this is what I was attempting to do. A flat uh, upper part of our section here in our sample, at the top there, you can see that there's no fossils in it. And so we had to use also other means as well. And this is where carbon isotopes come in handy. So carbon isotopes, these are stable carbon isotopes I'll be talking about tonight. 
So these aren't radioactive isotopes. You can't date them like you would radioactive uranium or anything like that. You use stable carbon isotopes. And in nature, there's two general forms. There's carbon-12 and carbon-13. That means they have the atomic mass of 13 and 12. And the, the more normal form we're thinking of generally when we look at the periodic table is carbon-12, but of course it does occur as carbon-13 as well in nature. And when we talk about this generally, in, we talk about it generally as what we call delta-13 or delta carbon-13, which is just the change in the amount of the ratio between carbon-13 to carbon-12. And so if you have a positive one, you have more carbon-13. If you have a negative one, you have more carbon-12. And if you have a neutral one, you have a normal or sort of a to a standard, basically. And so what we can do is we can go through time and we can track the amount. And so what you're basically looking at down here at the bottom is sort of an example of the source being the atmosphere where a lot of the carbon is stored, dissolves into the ocean, and it accumulates in sinks, either biomass, and biology preferentially selects carbon-12. So when photosynthesis takes place, it preferentially selects carbon-12 out of the environment to sort of sequester into sugars and things. Whereas the carbon dates from the minerals in the environment just generally pick up what's in the environment at the time. So if you have more biomass, you'll have more carbon-13 uh, carbon in your in your minerals. If you have less biomass, you'll have more carbon-12 in your minerals. And so you can see this is sort of basically curved. So if we go up our section, if we're moving through time, through our rocks here, we notice that we're getting more and more carbon-13 and then it drops off again. And you can use these squiggles effectively to correlate between packages of rocks that don't have fossils. Now, having said that, you've got to be careful, of course, because of course, if you have no fossils or radioactive minerals, you don't know whether your squiggle here is school of further up the column or further down, because you could be comparing two squiggles that aren't the same age. And so you have to be relatively careful when you do this. However, if you have fossils or radioactive minerals, like we have in our cases, then you can actually use that to correlate rocks without necessarily having any fossils or reactive minerals in those rocks. So those are two methods. So fundamentally, I'm asking how old are the rocks in the Amadeus Basin using both fossils and isotopes. And by doing that, we can answer the important questions about deposition of um, sedimentary packages at the same time, as well as important evolutionary events. So I'll talk about those a bit later. So this is the Amadeus Basin, to those who are unfamiliar. So the Amadeus Basin is a large intracratonic basin. You can see it sits in the centre of Australia relatively. So it ranges from about Alice Springs, a little bit further north of it, all the way almost down to the Northern Territory border with South Australia. And then in the west, it ranges just over the Western Australian border. And then it also almost reaches the Queensland border. It actually bridges out a little bit. It's covered largely by sediment on this side. So largely that of the Simpson and, and a few other deserts. Uh, there's a number of groups within the Amadeus Basin, so they're grouped into sedimentary packages. And previously, a lot of work has been done on sort of the Ordovician all the way up until the Permian sections there, so the Lara Printer group and above. And this is largely because things like, for example, there's a lot of fish as well as groundwater and petroleum and gas that has been found in these units. And so a lot of people have done the work on the stratigraphy of these units in quite a bit of detail. Um, as well as, for example, the lower parts of the, uh, of the Perderuda group, so the Cambrian bearing sections, so the Ediacaran and Cambrian sections have a lot of work that's been done on them because, of course, the Ediacaran faunas have guarded a lot of interest over time, as well as some of the earliest Cambrian faunas as well. But the middle part hasn't actually received a great deal of paleontological interest. It has had a bit. So if we have a look, this is the sedimentary packages that you find in that sort of uh, part of the Perderuda group, so that sort of early to late Cambrian sections. So this is, prior to my work, this was basically the standard that was used. If you look at some uh, publications, they do vary a little bit. Some of them are trying to be a bit more precise. But because the paleontological work wasn't there, or it was based purely on field observations, um, there wasn't really any definitive assessment of what the ages of some of these rocks were. And the correlations between some of them was purely based on lithostratigraphy, so how the rocks are arranged. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is basically how the rocks were sort of laid out. You can see up in the northeastern portion of the basin, you can see that there's a lot of carbonates and that's where generally a lot of fossils occur. And as you move towards the southwest here on your left, you'll see that there's less and less that becomes sandier and there's actually less fossils that go towards the southwest as well. So I'll generally be talking about the uh, northeast, but I can talk a little bit about the west if people are interested at the end. You also see these funny symbols. These funny symbols indicate where gas or oil shows are occurring. And so as you can see, there has been a number of gas and oil shows within the Amadeus Basin, which is of interest to people obviously hunting for hydrocarbons. 
But of course, it also is interesting because these have often been used for correlation as well. And it also is interesting because some of these have often been um, associated with some people say extinction events and all sorts of things, uh, drying events or desiccation events within the Amadeus Basin. So some of these are very useful and very interesting in terms of understanding the geological history as well as the economic history of the basin and also for understanding some of the evolutionary history as well. So this was the current sort of model, but it's sort of a little bit cluttered. So I thought throughout the talk, what I'll do is I'll just turn it into a more simplified version. So this is sort of my attempt at simplifying it for people. So I won't be talking about the large number of various sandstone units only because they don't generally contain fossils, but I will be talking about most of the carbonate units in this talk. So this is sort of a simplified version of what I just showed you. You can see a lot of the units there of early, middle and late Cambrian. Now these terms aren't used that often these days only because the early, middle and late Cambrian in parts of the world meant different things. So for different continents, early, middle and late Cambrian were different. And so generally these days we now refer to uh, different stages within Cambrian. But because those weren't used when originally mapping the Amadeus, the great amount of work that people had done on mapping it, a uh, huge amount of work, that I've just left them in there because as we go through the talk, I'll show you that we've been a bit more precise with aging some of these units. Now, previous to my paleontological investigations, this was all that was known from these units. Uh, so what you're looking at here, these eight species, so six trilobites and two rostroconchs, which are sort of little mollusky bivalve like things, they were all that was known from the basin. And so, and I can tell you that that is a poor representation of the fossils in the basin <laughs> um, from these, these units that you're looking at. Um, so before that, there wasn't actually a great deal done on these units. And that's because largely they were ignored having not those early fish or, or, or uh, oil, gas show, uh, oil gas mining into those units before. So we started off by looking at the Tempe formation. So they started off doing, as part of my PhD, looking at the Tempe formation. We started with the Tempe formation. It was relatively easy to section for us. And that's because being in New South Wales at Macquarie University, it was easy for us to drive down to Geoscience Australia uh, rather than to the Amadeus Basin. Um, the reason we went to Geoscience Australia is that the Tempe formation, for those who've seen it in outcrop, is actually quite poor. You don't generally see it in the rocks out there because it's often weathered away. Uh, it's often full of sort of a sandstone that it, it crumbles quite easily and the limestone units often weather and get covered by sediment, so often river channels and things like this. So we went down to Geoscience Australia and had a look at the Tempe 40, uh, the Hermesberg 41 core in the, with the Tempe formation, as well as some of the overlying units as well. Previous to my work, nobody had done a great deal on it apart from looking at the acrotarchs. So these are little spore-like, possibly marine spores, um, people's sort of algal spores or something. And people had given it a sort of uh, early to middle Cambrian age range. It was quite a broad age range. And that's because there wasn't a great deal of work in Australia on that sort of time period. And so they just sort of broadly correlated it with the early middle Cambrian. And again, that was largely to do with also some of the lithostratigraphy as well. So we sampled the diversity of fossils. So you found these trilobites up here. So this was a new species of trilobite that we described, as well as a whole bunch of brachiopods and a bunch of small shelly creatures as well. Um, what we found was the brachiopods were the most useful in correlation, and they showed a great similarity to the Thnidna limestone in the Dali Basin. So anyone who's worked on sort of Central Australian stuff before wouldn't be too surprised by that. Um, the two units are very similar in a number of respects. And it's not too surprising as well, because previously people had suggested this sort of early middle Cambrian age, and that's what the Tyndall limestone is sort of suggested at as well. Outside the Northern Territory, it showed the greatest similarity to some of the upper units of the uh, Arawi Basin in, uh, in Australia, as well as some of the material that's been found in Antarctica. Now, one of the things that we did find was that the fauna only indicates what's called an Audian age. So for those who are not aware sort of, of the subdivisions of the Australian Cambrian timescale, that's basically what used to be sort of thought of as the top of the early Cambrian. Um, there was no middle Cambrian faunas at all. There was no indication that it was from the middle Cambrian. It seems to correlate well with some of the stuff, for example, in the Ord Basin with what's called the Zistradura and the Greena Redlichia Forestai zone. And so we can definitively say it's, it's late, early Cambrian in age. And so if we go back to our diagram, we can modify it a little bit. So I've modified the simplified diagram here with those units of rock. And now we can give it an Audian age. We don't just have to say early Cambrian, we can say Audian. And we can put an age there because it's about 508 million was um, so this upper Audian in age. 
Uh, we can also say that there's very little in the various uh, sandstone units that lie above it as well, because I sectioned a lot of those and looked for fossils in them and found absolutely nothing. So there's very little above the Tempe Formation. And so what this led us to think is, well, if the Tempe Formation is purely Audian in age, what about the Giles Creek Dollarstone? Because of course the Giles Creek Dollarstone you'll see in the east is often thought to correlate with it. Uh, a lot of people have often suggested that the two units are basically just lateral equivalents of each other. So one is just basically the deeper water environment of the other. So the Giles Creek Dollarstone being in theory deeper. So the Tempe Formation. So we decided to section that as well and have a look and see what we could find. Historically, the Giles Creek Dollarstone has been a bit of a muddle. Uh, a lot of people have suggested a whole bunch of different ages for it. Um, when it was sort of initially sectioned paleontologically, it was collected from four different localities by and when he collected material, he collected it from a whole bunch of diverse areas. And when he took samples, he only collected really one from the type section. So where the Giles Creek Dollarstone was described from, so where the sedimentary package is actually got its defining units. And so what we can see here is there's a mix of fauna. So for example, we can see Redlichia and Oranaspis, and both of those are known only from the early Cambrian. But however, we also see things like Nepea, and Nepea is known from generally the Templetonian above. So it's generally known from the middle Cambrian. And so this is a bit confusing. So this led people, to, for example, the late great John Shergold to comment in his 1986 sort of publication on the Amadeus that the, the, the Giles Creek Dolstone may actually be slightly younger than what people think it is. He thinks he thought it was middle Cambrian. Um, however, Erpek, when he initially described the Audian stage, he actually described the stage, the, the, this Audian stage that we now use. He actually used two sections in the Giles Creek Dolstone as examples of the Audian in Australia. So it's a bit muddled exactly where it sits in the timeline. And of course, the history of the Audian and Templetonia are a bit muddled as well. So we decided to section it. We went to the Ross River Gorge, and that's because we can get a good outcrop exposure there. That's the defining section as well. It's the type section for the Giles Creek Dollstone. And it also means that we don't have to look at any drill cores. And drill cores are difficult for fossils because you only find little bits and pieces in a small core. Whereas if you're out in the field, you've got a whole heap of rock to look at, basically. So here we are in the Ross River Gorge, and you can see here that it's a nice syncline, so you can see all the strata sticking up at about 45 degrees. And you can see the units just sitting one on top of the other. There's the Todd River Dollstone, and there's the Giles Creek Dollstone in the background, and here we are standing on just a hillside continuation of that. And here's some evidence that I was there, although you can't really see it. There's me sitting down there with John Patterson sampling fossils along the Giles Creek Dollstone. And these were collected in two field seasons. We did 2010 and 2014. 2010 was John Patterson and Glenn Brock and a few others, and I myself was in uh, 2014. So what did we find? Well, first I'll tell you about some of the interesting stuff. So we dissolved some of the limestone in acid and we found these phosphatic fossils. These are Bradorids. Bradorids are a bit like ostracods. They're sort of crustacean like animals. Uh, people sort of suggest that they're close relatives of crustaceans. And what you're looking at is basically the bivalved carapace or sort of the, the shell of these animals. And so we described four new species, and this was the first time that Brodorids were actually recorded in the Amadia space and outside of field observations that they're potentially there. These Brodorids had close affinities with those found in the Georgina Basin, so the neighbouring basin to the north and a little bit to the, the east. And they suggested that it was a Templetonian age, so sort of middle unusual again, that's what uh, John Shergold had suggested for the, for the Giles Creek Goldstone. And there was no indication of an early Cambrian age in these Bredorids. The trial bites showed the same. So these are some of the trial bites we found. It was a diverse fauna that contained at least 12 different taxa. Um, some were previously described, although we also found four new species as well. And this also suggested a Templetonian age. So none of these taxa had early Cambrian uh, analogies. All of them were sort of traditional Australian middle Cambrian trilobites. Uh, very close correlations with the Georgina Basin and even particularly more close correlations with uh, the Coonigan Formation, which is in um, New South Wales, in western New South Wales. In fact, it actually shows a great deal of similarity to the Coonigan Formation in many ways. And two taxa in particular were diagnostic. So we had here Zistagura flivora and Pagia lacunda, and both of those we could correlate with the Pentagnostis um, pancurensis and Pentagnostis anabarensis zones of the neighbouring Georgina Basin. And that gave us an early Templetonian age. So this is clearly middle Cambrian. 
and the, all the fauna is clearly Middle Cambrian in age. There's no indication of early Cambrian faunas in the Giles Creek Dollar Stone. So this suggested that the, the Giles Creek Dollar Stone was Middle Cambrian, definitively Middle Cambrian. And so that meant it's not correlatable to the Tempe Formation. It is not laterally equivalent, which is a bit new. People hadn't actually suspected that before. And so what we're looking at here, I modified a little bit again, so we can say the Giles Creek Dollar Stone in Aram is now Templetonian in age, so we can chuck in a, a, a 504.5 million year old age limit on that. And so as we move along, we can also see that the species like Oranaspis and Relichia that had been described from it before, because you might go, well, those suggest early Cambrian ages, surely. Because they're not found in the type section, and we didn't find any evidence of early Cambrian taxa in the type section, it's likely that they're actually from another unit. So something like the, the um, Hugh River Shale, which often gets confused with things like the Giles Creek Dollstone, particularly as you move further west and things like the Giles Creek Dollstone become much more shaley and much more clastic. So much more sediments derived from the land surface rather than carbonates. And so we started going right here. Well, if we can't really sample the Hugh River Shale because it's also quite difficult to access some of it sort of in areas that are quite inhospitable and quite remote. We decided to sample the Shannon Formation because the type section of it is also in the Ross River Gorge. So we had a look at where people had actually described fossils from the Shannon Formation. And I'll actually, this is sort of, I've done this in a bit retrospect. When we actually were sampling this, and if you look at maps, this is actually mapped as the Goida Formation. Um, but looking at the lithology, it looks like it's actually part of the Shannon Formation. So previously, Erpec, when he had gone through and done a lot of the, the amazing um, paleontology sort of initial uh, bits and pieces that he did in the basin, as well as some of the work that the survey had done, he noted that there was a bunch of fossils at one of the bends in the river. So we had a look at this bend, and you can see here that he's listed a series of taxa, but none of these he figured or described, he just lists that they're there. He says that they exist, but nothing more. Uh, he actually says that there's two crustaceans as well, which turned out to be those rostroconchs. Uh, he misidentified them as crustaceans. Um, and these two rostroconchs, as you can see, are pretty poorly preserved and they're not um, in the best uh, condition and they're also not very diagnostic as well. So what we did was we went back there to sample for trial bites. And so here you can see this is a picture from the ground. So here I am sort of standing on top of the low rise, which is where the arrow is. The rise is actually buried in the photograph behind all those trees. But you can see the overlying unit sitting behind it there. And so when we sampled it for trial bites, we found a huge number of trial bites. So we found 22 species. So these are some of the species that we found, and we found three new ones, uh, and a lot of connections with South China. Uh, so there's a lot of species that have commonalities with South China, and there's a lot of commonality with the O'Hara Shale and the Georgina Basin. This correlation allows us to suggest, particularly the presence of agnostids. So these two species of agnostid, these are close cousins of trial bites. They're not trial bites themselves, but or people often place them as close cousins of trilobites or other, other crustacean-like things. And they suggested strongly that these came from the upper part of the Middle Cambrian. So we go from the Giles Creek Dolston at the base of the Middle Cambrian, all the way to the top of it, at the top of the Shannon Formation. And what we have is the Glyptagnostus stolodotus zone, which is known again from the Georgina Basin, the nearby basin. And that gives us an age of about 497.5 to 497 million years old. We can be that precise within that half a million year range. We also found some other shelly faunas as well, these gastropods and brachiopods, as well as a new rostroconch species. And some of those actually range into the lower parts of the lower goida formation as well. Now, interesting, even though the two units seem to be conformable. And what we get is this sort of extinction interval here where we just, all the trilobites disappear. And that's curious because in the Mindy Allen at the top of the Diagnostic Stolodota zone, there is a extinction event that is globally known. And so people have suggested that this may actually be um, the, this global extinction event we're seeing here. We're seeing this disappearance of trilobites, which suggests that the lower goiter formation actually moves into the Lake Cambrian, which would be what the initial uh, mappers had suggested too. So we went back and sampled it for isotopes, because of course, if we didn't have many diagnostic fossils, we could use isotopes. So we sampled it for isotopes. And just to give you an example of why there might not be fossils, you can see up the top here, a whole bunch of pebbly conglomerates. This is a flat conglomerate. And you almost never find fossils in these sorts of deposits. So it was no wonder that we weren't finding any fossils and it was very shallow water deposits. And so using those isotopes, we we're able to co correlate those with others around the basin. So this is work I did with a colleague in Western Australia, and she sampled a whole bunch of cores and included our samples there on the, on the uh, right in the Goy section there. 
And what you can see is we could trace the extinction event all the way across the basin from the eastern part all the way over at least the W coordinates to the And what we also saw was that we could see the carbon isotope showed a clear positive isotopic trend all the way across the basin. And this suggested that this was the SPICE event. So globally, there's an event known after this extinction interval called SPICE, which is the Steptonium positive isotope excursion. That's a fancy name for basically just saying this positive peak. And it's known from the US, so hence its name, Steptonium. But it's been identified globally. So in the UK and in China, for example, as well, as well as in the neighboring Georgina Basin. And so we could use this to correlate without fossils, although we had fossils either side of it, we could use it to correlate the lower goiter formation. So using that, we know in the Georgina Basin that there's the Glyptagnosis Reticulatus Zone and Irving Eller Zones, and both of those sort of bracket the ice event. And so that, therefore, we assume that we can do the same thing with the isotopic curves here in the Amadeus. And so we can correlate it with some of the stages in the Georgina Basin. So we can put the age of that at about 497 to about 494, the lower goiter formation. One of the other things we can also say is that Ross River Gorge, there actually isn't the upper goiter formation. So we tried sampling there and we showed no isotopic signal, which is in common with the upper goiter formation. So the upper goiter formation just doesn't exist there. And for people who know the Amadeus space, and this wouldn't seem unusual because there are some packages that are miss missing sedimentary wise, uh, particularly up towards the Lake Cambridge and Ordovician from the Amadeus Basin. And so it's possible that this even started a bit earlier than people had previously suspected with the lower with the upper goiter formation not being present. So I wanted to still get an age, however, on the upper goiter formation. By this stage, I'd finished my PhD and, and moved on and started work. However, when I was at Geoscience Australia one day, I discovered a locality card for an upper uh, goiter locality that had trilobites in it. Uh, it only had one species, however. Uh, this isn't the card here. I actually don't have a photo of the card that's a good quality photo, but I've given an idea of what the cards from Geoscience Australia look like for lo their locality cards. And it came from the Waterhouse Ranges near Henbury. And so what you're looking at here is a little a tributary creek that comes off one of the sort of central parts of the Waterhouse Ranges. And what we found in there was this trilobite here at the top on the right. So this trilobite here looks very similar to some of the species that John Shergold described from the, uh, the Lake Cambrian of the Georgina Basin. And so it wouldn't surprise me if the upper goiter formation could be correlated with some of the units like the Chatsworth limestone, for example. However, we only have that one species and I want to actually go out to this part of the basin and sample it at some stage. Uh, I was hoping to do it this year. It looks like it will be next year, of course, with the virus. Um, but to go out and sample this, we're seeing if we can find even more diagnostic factor than this one to see if we can give it a proper age. But at the moment, it looks like it's Lake Cambrian is the upper goiter formation. So what we can do in summary is we can modify the old, um, the old system that was for the stratigraphy, so the old uh, stratigraphic uh, diagram, which was sort of done in sort of broad um, packages because it was done quickly as part of the mapping exercises back in the 50s to the 80s. And so we can now make it a bit more specific. We can tie it down. We can also identify hiatuses, sedimentary hiatuses that weren't necessarily present in the field uh, or weren't obvious in the field. So for example, those are the uh, um, above the Tempe formation and that below the Giles Creek Dollstone. And we can also identify where packages don't correlate anymore. So things like the Giles Creek Dollstone and Tempe formation, we now no longer know, we now, we now know that they no longer correlate with one another. We can also identify that extinction event. So we can start to look at biological processes across this extinction event in the Amadeus. And that means we can also look at it, compare it within Australia as well, because of course it's already well known within the Georgina Basin too. So where to from here? So I've started moving up into the Ordovician sections. So this, for example, over here on the left is a species of uh, Calamenid from the Amadeus Basin that I'm currently working on describing. And Calamenids, if you know Calamenids in Australia, they're relatively rare. They're actually quite unique in Australia. There's only two uh, species currently known, and both of them are known of fragment bits of head and, and a bit of tail. However, this one's a nice one. So it's a, it gives you a lot of idea of the anatomy of the animal. And when I was comparing it, I was starting to find others as well. When I started to do some work on New South Wales, so particularly around the Gunning Blaine area, we started to find other calamids as well, as well as some I've been uh, from a colleague in Tasmania, who also gave me some as well, some calamids. Again, all of these are from the Ordovician. And calamids from the Ordovician are, are, very, are hugely rare in Australia. So finding three all at once was bizarre. 
So there may be some sort of cryptic diversity of these guys in Australia that hasn't been previously looked at. I'm also describing a large species of trilobite. So this is a large tail found in the Amadeus Basin. It was found at Kings Canyon. If you measure it out, it's about 20 centimetres, just the tail, so just the pygidium. Uh, and that means that it probably reached somewhere around 668 millimetres in total length, which should make it the second largest trilobite in the world. Um, it would also mean that it is the it is also the largest trilobite found in Australia by a far margin. Um, and so this is another species that I'm describing. So I'd like to thank a bunch of people that helped out with this presentation, including my supervisors, Glenn Brock and John Patterson. I'd also like to thank a number of my colleagues who've helped publish, as well as the funding bodies, Macquarie University and the Australian Research Council, which funded my PhD, as well as the Australian Museum Foundation, which is helping me fund some of the research currently on the Ordovician in the Amadeus. So thanks very much. And I think we'll open that to questions. Is that right, Sabine? Yeah, absolutely. Who's got questions? Thanks, Pat. That was fantastic. Come on, round of applause. Okay, any questions? Yes, I've, I've got one. Thanks, Patrick. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I've spent a bit of time in the Amartya all the way back. Yes, uh, one thing that always intrigued me was in the goiter formation, there was a pretty distinct mag mag manganiferous horizon. Is that anywhere near the spice and in your estimate? Um, when I was out in the Amadeus, I didn't, I didn't really notice any manganese deposits, but then a lot of them were overgrown. So a lot of the sections, we had to actually dig out the limestones and shales. So it was hard to actually get outcrop that was good enough to actually see any sort of good examples of. We had to section a lot of it. So if you look at the lithostratigraphic column that I did as part of the trilobite paper, which again is the actual of the goiter formation, because we later correlated it with the Shannon, but um, in the upper parts of the goiter, you'll see that the upper parts in particular, we couldn't see a great deal of. So a lot of the time we had to assume it was sandy dollar stone. So I didn't see that manganiferous horizon. However, there is, um, there was one horizon which was distinct at the top of what we would correlate with the lower goiter formation uh, where it contacts the Bakuda. Uh, and we could see that that contained a lot of manganese in it. Now, I don't know whether it's the same thing that you saw, um, possibly. Um, it may, it, the one you might have seen may have actually correlated with the spice event, however. Yeah, at the eastern end of the Waterhouse Range, when you're up there next year to chase up those trial boats, uh, yeah. there is a quite a bit in there. The, most of the goiter appeared to be a very friable yellow sandstone with bits of manganiferous, manganiferous stuff all over the place. And also the cattle were using it as a salt lick. So there's wow. a hell of an environmental story in there as well. Yeah, that's quite interesting. interesting. Yep. It's, it's, it's unusual. I, I didn't realise the cattle actually, they love the carbonates too. They, you often find them sitting or hang, hanging around the carbonates. <laughs> We'd often find them in the valleys chasing after the carbonates, I'd say, or the grass at least that grows on the carbonates. Okay, well, thanks. It was a great talk. Thank you. Have you got anybody okay. else? <laughs> thanks, John, for the question. Anybody else? Yeah, hey, it's Tara Pat. How's it going? Well done. That was really lovely. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was actually just wondering how you distinguish the different species, is it based on morphology or do you extract DNA as well from the trilobites? Um, so it's purely based on morphology. There's no DNA left in these. In those? Yeah, they, they, so a lot of them are recrystallized. Yeah, um, okay. So they've even lost their original mineralogy in a lot of cases. And in fact, in some of the sandstones in particular, so some of the goiter, for example, and some of the Shannon trilobites are in sandstones and it's even worse for the Ordovician. Um, they're, they're almost always sandstone casts, so it's purely based on the morphology. But there's still cool. a lot of characters that you can pull out. Trilobites mm. in particular are full of characters, uh, unlike some other groups that are quite difficult to discern characters, particularly when they're not well preserved. Trilobites in particular are very good at discerning characters. Cool. Uh, and you get used to it. Um, John used to tell me that <laughs> it was... Um, it was he, he referred to as staring time, where you'd look at basically <laughs> images, after images after images. So all these books on this shelf here, for example, are all monographs full of trilobites all over the world. And so basically, they're just a large category, and you end up doing the image recognition um, for a lot of this. Cool. Thank you.
Could I ask a follow-up one, Patrick? Sure. Yeah, the um, one thing that I remember somebody way, way back was describing the Todd River with reef uh, or bioherm structures. Are, are you aware that there is a seismic line that was taken back in 1981 that actually shows uh, what appears to be a pinnacle reef at the uh, Giles Creek level that oh. might have some interest? And, yeah, that's uh, interesting. No, I haven't seen that. And we also cut a core in Wallaby Number no. One in what we thought was the Giles Creek, which I think Mike Owen might have actually looked at uh, for Cambrian microfossils. There might be a report of that floating around somewhere too. Yeah, it would be interesting. I tried to get a lot of the older cores as well. The trouble was when I turned up to the survey and asked them, sometimes they would say they didn't know where they were. <laughs> so I, I once asked for a section to the Wallaby one and um, I asked the survey and their answer was, oh, we, we don't quite know where it is, uh, the section I was looking for at least. So it became a bit difficult to track these things down. Yeah. Um, well, I've so, got pieces of course over here that uh, I'd love to give to somebody because I'm downsizing at the moment. Oh, if there's any from the, any through the Cambrian sections, I'd, I'd love to have a look at them. They're very interesting. I'd be very curious if they've got any of that reefal material in it because the archaeocyathid should be extinct by, of course, the Middle yeah. Cambrian. So you wouldn't expect to find them. But I suspect that there's a, a few more units that are misidentified in Mardius because a lot of the time you're dealing with uh, carbonates. And so it's no wonder the, the poor old mappers who had to go around and map it uh, made a, quite a number of, I think, just sort of, um, that they, they over-correlated rather than under-correlated because they were just dealing with sedimentary units of, of basically carbonate and sandstone that had nothing else in them that they could correlate with. True. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, there, there was a question here in the chat uh, from Amber that uh, she thought the Wallaby one was missing. Um, yes, well, that, that would that would go with what I said. Because <laughs> when I tried to find it, I couldn't find the Wallaby one core either. <laughs> well, that's that's very interesting because it was um, quite a long core, um, probably better than nine meters. Mm. Um, I don't have any bits of that at all, not even little rock chips out of it. I do have photographs, which are probably useless, and I think I've got some of Mike Owen's uh, old reports on the, yeah. the Cambrian section in the east, which were uh, from pan-continental petroleum days, which was uh, 90, 81, sorry, not mm. 1891, but it feels like <laughs> uh, 1981. Pretty close. <laughs> If you're interested, I can try and dig them up for you. Just um, definitely, yeah, definitely. If you, if you could dig them up, because I, I had a real uh, trouble trying to get some of those old pan continental reports because a lot of the time they weren't digitized. And when I would ask, a lot of people would say, "Oh, I did have a copy and I threw it out." So <laughs> a lot of the time they went missing. Um, and it's we the had, trouble we had these students. Yeah, we had students up there doing their honors degrees from University of New South Wales and. I think John Laurie recovered some of those from somewhere, which I would dearly love to have copies of myself. Mm. Yes, I got some of them, John. I, I had a lot of conversations with John about uh, the Amadeus, and he, he's obviously explored it a lot as well. Um, so some bits and pieces that he told me that I haven't seen any records of, so there must be his own personal observations as well. Yeah. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, hello, it's Marita here. I loved your talk, Patrick. Very good. Uh, does your work throw any light on the real age of the Chandler limestone and the associated <laughs> salt? I wondered when somebody might ask about the Chandler. <laughs> You'll notice that I intentionally left it out. <laughs> There's a good reason for that. It's, it's quite difficult because the Chandler, I did actually process some Chandler limestone from the Hermansburg core actually in acid. Um, and it fizzes like crazy. Um, and all you get out is oil. Like it dissolved the entire core chunk that I put in there in less than an hour. <laughs> and then all that was left was, was uh, carbonate bubbles and oil that had come yeah. out um, and blobs of oil, big blobs of it. Um, but there's no, it seems like there's no, at least body fossils as far as I could find in it. 
Um, it's a really basal unit to the Giles Creek dollar stone that's afossiliferous at the Giles Creek um, section, in the, in the type section, that could possibly correlate to it because it's, it's unlike, in my paper on the Giles Creek dollar stone, you'll see at the lithostratigraphic stratigraphic column, there's a limestone at the base which has chert nodules in it. Oh, and, yeah. and I wasn't quite sure what that was because if you look at any other description of the Giles Creek dollar stone, there's no other thing that refers to a chert nodule horizon. And it was a very distinctly different color and texture to the rest of the Giles Creek dollar stone. So I did wonder if it might correlate to that. Um, the trouble is, of course, it's difficult without fossils in it. Um, if there were any fossils in it, it might be easier to sort of say, but I just, I just assumed it was part of the Giles Creek dollar stone. Um, my guess is, and this is only sort of spitballing here, I'm sort of, I don't have any real evidence for this outside of the fact that because the sections in New South Wales, particularly those around Binguano Bore and areas like that, and sort of um, near sort of uh, the Minguano Ranges, uh, you find that there's a Batoman section in there. So there's a Stangier and things like that, um, sort, of the, sort of the early Cambrian sections, lower than the Audian. Um, it possibly might correlate to that. Um, that would make a lot of sense to me if it was the case, uh, because there seems to be this connection between sort of New South Wales and, and um, the Marius, but it's a bit difficult to say without fossils. I mean, I'm talking really outside of what we have evidence for there. Right, thank you. Yeah, so is there a eustatic fall in sea level at that time? Can you comment on that? <laughs> uh, it does look like that's the case, but it seems like that's a common occurrence in the Amadeus. So the Amadeus sections look like, when you look at the carbonates, there's a lot of um, horizons where, particularly with the stromatolites, you'll get, it, when the Shannon, for example, there's no body fossils throughout 90% of the Shannon. It's only in the last top bit of it that you get any fossils in it. And the, the large chunk of the Shannon, it looks like it's been eroded quite deeply in places because some of the stromatolites have erosional horizons that run through them. So you can mm -hmm. see stromatolitic sort of sides where it would have originally formed a little dome and there's a cut through it. And then there's a stromatolite that's grown on top of it. And the same thing repeats and repeats and repeats. And so I suspect that there's quite a lot of desiccation that's gone on in the Amadeus that really the only times we have preservation are when the sea level was highest. Um, yeah. Whether that was from new static falls or whether that was from sort of global sea level rise is a bit hard to say. Yes, and some of the, the halite casts I'm assuming are showing there as well. Mm. Very, very common. Mark Stillstone, but I'm cheating. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, yes. Thanks, there's still lots to understand in the Amadeus. Yes, the, the um, Stokes Siltstone oh, is a perfect okay. example. Oh yes, here's a nice example. <laughs> it's trace <laughs> That's possibly the Bakuda, but it might be older. Mm, okay, it could be. If it's got trace fossils, it's probably Bakuda. You start to get a lot of them in the Bakuda, although there's some in the Arumba as well, but you don't get any trilobitic ones. Well, if anybody knows where A85-401 is, A I'd love to know. Is it AS or just A? A, A, A85, 1985, collected number 401. It might be one of the students from uh, University yes. of New South Wales, but which Just one of them? It would be the Alice Spring sheet, and you could work that out pretty quickly. <laughs> no, not if it's one of the student ones. It just meant a marvel. Yeah. <laughs> not if it's a student specimen. If it's a GA specimen with AS on it, you could work it out. Mm. That would be a special and exciting Easter egg hunt uh, variation. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think um, we'll leave the questions here. We'll, um, I'll, I'll ask one general question, then we can just have some general discussions. Um, Pat, I'm very excited to hear about the renovations of the Australian Museum. Can you give us an update? Sure, so the Australian Museum's currently going through renovations of the interior. Uh, so currently, what I'm allowed to say to the public is what's been released to the public. <laughs> um, so we're currently building a Come new on. exhibition space, um, as well as we're renovating what's called the Grey Hall. So it's the hall as you enter through, you go past the skeleton gallery. A lot of those people who haven't come in for a while may actually think I'm talking about the front entrance, which is the old entrance. Uh, you used to go into a large hall, which you have the temporary exhibition space, and then you used to have the gift shop in about the 2010s. 
Um, that area is now being completely turned into a large hall, uh, and that will host a temporary exhibition space, as well as a lower story, which is also now housing and also a large exhibition space, temporary exhibition space as well. So we're effectively doubling the size. Um, there's also quite a bit of space that we're taking with um, new spaces for education. So we're also building a new education space as well as potentially a couple of extra galleries. And the mineral gallery has been promised a new space as well. So we're also getting a mineral gallery. Uh, so the Chapman collection, at least part of it will come back and be on display uh, as well as Ross is currently going through. So any of you who know Ross Pogson, the minerals collection manager, he's currently designing a new minerals gallery for that as well. Uh, so that's the current status and it's going ahead even despite the uh, virus and the lockdown. Um, and despite the museum, uh, people from the museum working from home, the construction workers are there doing a lot of work. And so we're ending up having a, a large, a larger exhibition spaces than we previously had. Oh, sorry, I can't, can't quite hear you, Sabine. Sorry, yes, I'm, yeah, I put my <laughs> microphone in mute. Haha, <laughs> I wanted to share um, my G plate screen just in case anybody wanted to see where Australia was 500 million years ago. There, there we are, right? Um, Have you got the Amadeus Basin right, though? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Have you got the Amadeus Basin right? Sometimes people put it a bit too far west, I find. <laughs> well, well, what I've got here is the best paleogeographic map you'll ever find, and this is Marita <laughs> Bradshaw's map. So it, it has to be right. Uh, Peter Cook and Jenny Tardadell's map, that one. Of course, um, yeah. Huge team effort from GA. Um, but I think it's it's kind of cool um, that you mentioned um, South China, the affinity to South China. Um, you know, I know that there's kind of ongoing and continued questions about the affinities and where the blocks were tucked in. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Um, well, it looks like from the faunas, at least, there's a strong connection to China and Antarctica. Uh, New Zealand's a bit weird. So I'm actually working on some New Zealand trial bites at the moment with Jim Jago and John Laurie. Uh, we were working with Roger Cooper. Of course, he sadly passed away recently. Hmm. Um, but Roger's worked in that area for a long time in New Zealand. And interestingly, the New Zealand fauna show sort of a weird connection to a lot of different places, including North America. Uh, and similarly, the, some of the brachiopods in Australia also show strange connections to North America. Um, now, there's, there's discussion as to why exactly that is, whether the block was close or whether it was because people have just, the North American sections have documented brachiopods quite well. And so whether people are just lumping things into North American taxa is also a question there too. But at least with the trial bites, we see strong connections to South China and Antarctica. Um, particularly during the Middle Cambrian, particularly the Upper Middle Cambrian, there's a lot of connections to, to um, China. In fact, it's almost, in some cases, the genera are all identical in some deposits. Uh, right. All you're just varying is the species. That's very interesting. Uh, John Patterson here comments uh, that these paleodraft maps are excellent, but it sounds like Marissa <laughs> Betts is going to, uh, to improve them. So we'll have to get Marissa to give a talk later in the year.